if I hear a song and I want to know everything that this artist has ever done, like is TikTok the platform for that? Or do I hear a song and go, oh, that's pretty cool. And then uh, 20 seconds later, I'm in another song and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then I'm in another one and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I'm never deepening or getting a richer experience. The challenge with a platform like TikTok, do they allow artists to get deeper with their fan base. Welcome to Lion Tree's 2023 Outlook series. And this year, we'll be presenting sector specific overviews from our Lion Tree managing directors, leading up to the January 17th release of Lion Tree founder and CEO Arya Burkov's annual Outlook interview with public markets lead Leslie Mallon. We are here with James Lindsay, a managing director in our Lion Tree London office, focused on music in addition to his work in sectors like digital media, sports, ed tech, and e commerce. There really is no music perspective without a point of view on Taylor Swift. So before we really get into this, what is your favorite Taylor Swift song and why is it Antihero? I mean, Antihero is definitely my favorite Taylor Swift song. Um, And it's, I mean, it really captures the ethos of Taylor Swift and it's the reason why she's so lovable. Like she's a, she's a vulnerable, despite being a star, she's a vulnerable human being. And frankly, that's the, that's the beauty of music. It connects us with uh, artists emotionally and and I'm sure we'll be talking about like how do you build a more profound connection between an artist and a fan base. And Taylor Swift is an absolute masterclass in that. Like Taylor Swift's fans are rabid. And uh, what she's done to cultivate that is really very impressive. And there's a lot to be learned from that. And there's a lot that can be done in terms of new next gen technologies that can help build that e- even more. Right. So big, big Taylor Swift fan. Using Taylor Swift as a case study, it is clear that artists need to establish this authentic connection with their fans to be successful. So how is the industry and record labels adapting to support artists in today's creator-driven world? Well, I mean, probably not quickly enough. And and the reality is those artists that you see who build really meaningful relationships with their fan base are artists that are doing it themselves, often authentically right i think taylor swift's connectivity with her fan base comes from an authentic vulnerability that she's felt and she sort of is there for her fans in that in that sense she speaks for them when she writes lyrics i mean i just watched the um xxx tentacion um documentary that was produced by our friends over at fader you see in that a completely different style of music obviously but the thing that really stood out to me there Frankly, there were two things that stood out to me in the documentary that I didn't really understand about the X um, story was the first being how incredibly connected he was to his fans, right? I've listened to his music. I appreciate his music. I like his music. It doesn't really speak to me being sort of a middle-aged white investment banker, but it really speaks to a sector of the population who, when he died, sorry, spoiler alert for those of you who didn't know, he, he is dead. Um, when he died, people went into mourning, like, because he had helped them through difficult times, right? And again, it speaks to the, the power of music. But the other thing that stood out for me from that documentary was he refused a pretty cash rich deal because he felt he would be in chains if he took that deal and ended up signing a much um, smaller sort of total dollar number advance deal, but that would give him more control and give him more ownership of his, of his product which is so hard to do. I mean, he did that, I think, at the age of 17, right? Like most 17-year-olds are total idiots and don't have the um, you know, foresight to think that way. And you throw a big million-dollar number at someone at that age, they're going to sign on the dotted line. But he sort of understood, and it comes back to Taylor Swift as well, with the whole thing around her owning her own music and how it upset her when she didn't own her own music. Um, it, it, it's sort of part of that same thematic. It's like, the artist owning their own creative output, owning their own work, um, which is especially important to people who really pour their emotion into their art. And then the connectivity between the fans and the artists and how you build that. But how do you see record labels being able to support the artist and distribute their work while also maintaining that freedom for artists to do what they do best? Yeah. Well, look, the the reality is it's harder than ever for record labels nowadays because um, the way the music industry has evolved, um, you know, where it used to be people discovered music through radio, that was actually very easy for the record labels to add value because they could come up with a, this is our release schedule. We're going to put 
the right marketing dollars behind a single or an album when it's released. We're going to make sure it gets radio play. We're going to make sure it's in the ears of listeners. We're going to make sure it's in the right um, distribution channels. And that's how we're going to support an artist, right? So that was a formula that worked very well. Then you enter into the streaming era and it's all about getting into playlists and um, getting discovered in that way. Um, and now we've gone a step further, which is the TikTok era where, you know, you speak to executives in the music industry and they're like, it's really, really hard because people aren't, people are listening to music for 20 seconds and then they're moving on to something else. And TikTok really has no incentive to create a better experience for the listener necessarily. And I, I use the term better as a subjective term, but or to create more engagement for an artist, right? Like that's not TikTok's mission. TikTok is driving engagement and they can do that extremely well as we've seen. Um, so it's very hard for a label now to sort of st step in and say, look, I'm gonna help you um, get to your fans. And then, and then sorry, the, the, the next layer of that is actually building the engagement between the artist and the fan, which used to be done through interviews it used to be done through um, live music. Those tools are still out there, but it's just so much more complicated. It's so much more diverse. So it, it is it is really hard. And, and we haven't even got onto Web3 and, and what that means in terms of engagement between an artist and a fan. So it it's hard for, for major labels. And I, I feel like the way they're coping with that difficulty is they're making more bets probably because it's harder to actually sort of designate someone a star and put the marketing dollars behind it and be like, we've decided this person will be a star, therefore they shall be a star. So you do probably have to diversify a little bit more. And, um, you know, that's that's the challenge of the industry. And in that same vein, do you feel that maybe platforms like TikTok have, in a sense, decentralized this kind of star power that used to be a record label would decide, Dolly Parton's a star, we're going to put all our marketing dollars behind her, and now she is one. The challenge with a platform like TikTok is... And it's still uh, it's still early innings in the TikTok story. The challenge is: do they allow artists to get deeper with their fan base, and vice versa? Right? Like, if I hear a song and I want to know everything that this artist has ever done, like, is TikTok the platform for that, or do I hear a song and go, "Oh, that's pretty cool," and then uh, twenty seconds later, I'm in another song and I'm like, "Oh, that's pretty cool," and then I'm in another one and I'm like, "Oh, that's pretty cool," and I'm never deepening or getting a richer experience. Which again, I don't want to sound like an old man talking about how I used to read the you know CD sleeve insert front to back and memorize them and build my relationship with the artist through that. But I do think you lose something if you don't go deeper into an artist's story and if you're just hearing sound bites. I know YouTube um, are trying to sort of bridge that gap and say we've got the YouTube shorts, but we also have the ability to go deeper. So maybe that's the um, the beacon of hope, right? Where Because there's no denying that TikTok is a phenomenal instrument for discovering music. What I haven't seen yet is, is it a tool to get deeper into music, learn more about music, build a stronger relationship with an artist? So you advised on the sale of 300 Entertainment to Warner Music. Can you talk a little bit about that transaction and the role of independent labels in today's music landscape? Yeah, look, I mean, I think coming back to your question around the, the, the majors and how record labels... Um, sort of help their artists nowadays, what we've seen is a proliferation of um, indie labels that either specialize in certain niche or, or, or just build an artist, a, a book of talent from being in a certain region, right? Like, um, you know, there's a big music scene in, in Atlanta at the moment where we're seeing a lot of indie labels coming out of there. Um, so th those indies, are often distributed by the majors. And what you see is the majors actually have this very positive relationship with the indies, where they're, they're, they're not even seen as competitors per se, but they're seen as, you know, these people are out there and they've got really great um, artists and repertoire um, capabilities and they can go out there and sign artists and break those artists and still distribute through the majors and still create that healthy ecosystem. So that's what, that's what sort of happened there where um, 300 were... Um, distributed by Warner. There was a very cordial and convivial relationship between those two um, entities. And, you know, 300 went out and had achieved a lot of success and signed a handful of really impactful, important artists that Warner would 
were, were interested in bringing into their roster. Kevin Lyles, who who ran 300, was also a, a prodigious talent as a music executive, and uh, that was a big part of the deal was getting him to come along. Because at, at the end of the day, while this is a big technology angle, and we've talked about that, this is still a people business, and um, you know, having people that can sign acts, have an ear for talent, but then also help those acts through these very difficult sort of industry sort of trends where you have to know how to release, you have to know how to talk to your fans, you have to know how to market on social um, and having people who can help you with that is is super helpful. So I think we will continue to see indies proliferate. I think we will continue to see majors buying indies once they scale. And I do think there will be a play where certain indies maybe get together through M&A or through a commercial deal or what have you, but where you end up creating a sort of congregation of indies outside of the major ecosystem, which would be very interesting to see. NFTs have been a way to build community in the digital realm. For example, Coachella implemented an NFT project in partnership with FTX earlier this year. First, do you see NFTs playing a role in the music industry long term? And second, do you think that my FTX Coachella t-shirt can now be branded as vintage? I, I mean, I think if you genuinely own an FTX Coachella t-shirt, that's I really do. cool. I do. <laughs> That's really cool. I don't know if it can be branded as vintage, but it's certainly cool. Um, no, I, look, I think NFTs um, definitely will have a role in the future of the music industry. Um, and one way of looking at it is is saying, what are things that, that exist in the music industry that could be done in an NFT way? So merch, fan engagement, there, there are things like VIP experiences. There are things that exist in the real world that could be ported to the NFT world. But the lens that I like to look at it through is what can NFTs deliver to the music industry that, that, that you're not getting currently? And I think the key there is data, um, where it's, it's actually quite surprising how little data there is on, on, on listening. Um, and labels don't necessarily have that much information on the fan base of their artists and where they are and how they're listening and where they're listening, right? That data could be much richer and could create uh, a, a lot of competitive advantages. I see the, the NFT, it, it's almost a Trojan horse, right? Where you're using the NFT to, you're giving fans something that they, I guess, want, right? Like a special edition merch thing that exists in the virtual world, whatever it is. But what you're getting out of that is you're getting data and you're getting real insights into who your real fans are, right? And what I think of is there have been movements where you can scan your barcode from going to a live show and get maybe video content from that show or other special features, right? This is in a pre-NFT world. Um, and the real benefit of that was just getting data on the people who've been at your show so that you can market to them the next thing, right? So I, I, that, that's where I see the NFT movement getting embraced, right? And it's very easy to roll your eyes at NFTs and, you know, talk about JPEGs of rocks and what have you. But I do think there is a real um, role for NFTs in music. And and that's where I see it really adding value is creating that richer data connection between the fan and the artist. So what else should we be keeping our eye on in the music and audio industries in 2023? Look, I think, um, I think we're going to see um, a lot of the trends we've seen um, happening historically are going to just continue, right? So we're going to see a, a, a broader diversification of the types of music that are listened to on streaming platforms, um, which is going to see niche music becoming more relevant, um, right? There was a world where if it wasn't hip hop or it wasn't pop, it didn't matter. And that world is no longer um, the reality and things have continued to diversify. So we'll see that. Um, I, I do think we're going to start to see there's been a lot of capital chasing returns in the music industry in a in a low interest rate environment, like getting yield out of music is is, you know, a very smart financial move. And we've seen a lot of smart financial players move into music. I think as interest rates go up, what that what that forces is you have to actually start to think a little bit more creatively and add a little bit more value. Um, right. You can't just buy catalog and, and rely on that as a as an asset class you need to be a little bit more thoughtful about it. So I do think we will see um, an indie label roll-up play or we'll see a um, indie label plus indie tech provider combination um, 
right? I think the industry is ripe for something um, like that. And uh, I, I'm hoping that, you know, the capital that's out there will see that that's the way to unlock value and get the returns that you that you need to get. How is this different from 2022? I mean, I don't think it's necessarily that different from 2022. In 2022, a lot of people have been asking what the hell's going on, right? <laughs> it's a trend we've seen across all industries. It's like, wow, what is this? Um, and, and frankly, when COVID hit, there was a brief moment of, wow, what is this? And then it sort of moved into a, I think we're okay. And let's just keep doing what we're doing. And then when 2022 hit, it was like, okay, I think this is more serious from an economic impact perspective. Um, so you certainly see a, a lot of people in 2022 more than any other year in, in recent history thinking, I, I just don't know where this, how this plays out. I just don't know where the economy is going. Um, and that uncertainty creates a little bit of a standing in place, right? So I think people have seen these trends and have seen how to exploit these trends, but probably have engaged in a wait and see. So I think in 2023, you're going to start seeing capital actually be deployed against these trends, right? You're going to see that indie roll up. You're going to see that um, um, continued investment in, in tech and, and how do you create a more sort of tech enabled distribution play. Thanks again for listening. Be sure to tune back in on January 17th to hear Lion Tree founder and CEO Arya Burkov's annual Outlook interview with public markets lead Leslie Mallon. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to Kindred Media for more insights from today's leaders in business and beyond.